slide with this on it. Uh, I-J-N-W-P, I-J-N-U-P, I think is how you pronounce it. Uh, years ago, I was a worship leader uh, of a church plan. It was kind of my first real ministry engagement. And while I was there, I would write this at certain parts of our order of worship that I would send out to, you know, the pastor, other volunteers helping to run the service, uh, and to the musicians on the stage. And what INJWP stands for is, in Jesus' name, we pray. It was a little tag that we would know, well, this is a part of the service where someone is going to pray. And I wrote it this way for two reasons. The first was, it was just fun to have a little inside thing for us as a young church plant. This is how we talk about prayer here. But there was a second important reason as well. Sometimes you do something over and over again, you get very used to doing it. And you forget why you do it in the first place. And I think sometimes ending a prayer with, in Jesus' name we pray, is something that we kind of forget what it means and stands for. It, you know, sometimes it could be treated like, well, that's what you're supposed to do to let God know that you're kind of wrapping up the prayer or letting people around you know that you're finally almost done with the prayer. But that's not, what, that's not why we say, in Jesus' name we pray. We say, in Jesus' name we pray, when we pray, because our prayer, our desire is that our prayer would be according to God's will, for his glory, and in his power. And so as, a, as, you know, as, as I was a, as my mentor who really emphasized Jesus essential to all things, I thought this is one way for us as, as an organization to keep that in mind on Sunday mornings, that the prayer was not just some passing time. It was not a transition in the service. It was not a time for the band to get down or the band to come up or for something to change, that the prayer was meaningful and important and for us to say fixed on Jesus Christ through that. That through this prayer, we are asking that we pray according to God's will for his glory and in his power. Because the only reason we could pray as a congregation at all is because of what Jesus has done for us. The only reason we have access to the creator of the universe, God our Father, is because Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was raised from the dead. And so when we pray, we want to remember that. The only reason we are to pray and God hears us and answers our prayers according to our will is because we are praying in Jesus' name. And when it comes to the Christian life, it's not just the prayer that we do in Jesus' name. It's all the things in our life we do, that we do in Jesus' name. When we come to church, we do that in Jesus' name. When we go to work and work hard and, and work not only for a living, uh, but do the things we're supposed to do and things uh, that we don't like doing very much, we do that in Jesus' name. That the Christian life means that when we go to school, we're doing our schoolwork and studying hard in Jesus' name. When you go home and uh, give your uh, spouse a kiss uh, after a long day, you're doing that in Jesus' name. That when you're in the tree stand sometime this fall, you can do that in Jesus' name. When you're playing Fortnite, which is apparently coming back from what I saw at someone's house the other week. You could do that in Jesus' name, that every aspect of our life, big and small, can be done according to his will, for his glory, and in his power. Do you believe that? Yeah. And, and we remember that with maybe some of the big things, maybe that work or school or, or home that's not a big stretch of the imagination. But getting ice cream in my family? Playing video games with my friend, that too? Yes, that too. And those are the ones we forget. But the life that is lived for Christ is lived in Jesus' name, in everything and everything. And that's what we're going to talk about the rest of the day. What it looks like to live that kind of life, to encourage all of us to pursue that kind of lifestyle where, where every part of it is giving glory to God and is really part of the larger worshipful life that we live throughout the rest of the week. Because worship is not just through Sunday. We give glory to God in all the different areas of our life. We're going to see this as a culmination of what we've been talking about really for the last couple months in the book of Colossians, which makes a central point that Christ is to be first in everything. That's why we've called this series that. And we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. You could turn there today. Paul has started off the letter saying that Jesus is worthy of being first in everything because he is the creator and by him and for him and through him all things that were made were made through him and by him and for him, uh, and, and, that, and that he is worthy of being first in our lives because he is the one through his death on the cross that has given us access to the Father, the hope of eternal life and a changed life today. And when it comes to that changed life, we don't need to be adding things onto Christ. It is Christ alone that's going to help us lead the changed life that God has for us. And so we warned against uh, legalism or mysticism or any of these things that look good on the outside but don't actually have any power 
to change us on the inside. And last week, we started in chapter 3 in kind of this new section where he's explaining what this life actually looks like. And he says, seek the things that are above, the things that are of Christ. Uh, uh, Set your minds on the things that are above, not the things that are of earth. And if you do that, if you seek Christ first, if you are setting your minds on Christ and understanding who God is, and who he created to be, then you naturally will act more like him in your life. And so last week, we talked about how he described that we were to take off this old self, like a piece of clothing, the old sinful, tempted self that we had, and all anger, malice, and there was a whole list of things that were very clearly sins and not good for us, not good for people around us, that we were to take it off like a piece of clothing and lay it aside when we set our minds on Christ, and instead put on this new self, which is in Christ, to clothe ourselves in a new attitude and attributes as we seek the things that are above. Although we kind of stopped short last week. We only talked about the old self things. We kind of only went through the attributes that we were to take off. This week, we're going to kind of finally look at what does this new life actually look like? What are these attributes that we are clothing ourselves with as we seek the things that are above. And here's how we're going to walk through it this morning. We're going to go back to that big idea that everything can be done in Jesus' name. Then we're going to look at something that's very specific, an emphasis that Paul is putting on that in our passage for the Colossians and for our own life. And then finally, some kind of direct applications of all that. All right, chapter three, we're going to start reading in verse 12. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and singing uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All right, where do we start in this? Because that was a big list, right? Well, I want to start actually at the end. I want to start in verse 17, because Paul makes a huge emphasis on verse 17. It doesn't read quite as clearly that way in English, but in the original language that the Bible was written in, coin a Greek, it has a kind of a neat feature to it. In English, word order really matters. If you jumble up the words, the sentence doesn't make any sense. But Greek is very expressive language, and so you could actually change some of the words in the sentence, and the sentence makes perfect sense, but by changing the order of the words, you could put a certain emphasis on something that helps modify the meaning of the sentence. And so if you look again at verse 17 here, when he says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Jesus, the words anything and everything are pushed right to the front of the sentence. And so this is not just a catch-all at the end, like, ah, if I forgot to mention one of these new attributes that you're to put on in Christ, ah, they're kind of covered in this section. No, 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 no. He's making a big point here right at the end. It's more of a summary of everything he said so far, that anything and everything you can do can be done for the glory of God. And we talked about what that looks like. In the name of Jesus, it is according to God's will and authority for his glory and in his power. How much is anything and everything? I ran out of words. I don't have any more synonyms. I guess I could have looked up another one. He used both of them, right? It's, it's literally everything. And sometimes I feel like we as Christians, what have my lamp here? All right. Sometimes we as Christians, uh, we kind of treat our life as if, as if it's a chest of drawers. And we have all these little compartments. And Sunday morning comes, and I come Sunday morning, and I pick, pick out the church stuff. I'm going to get my Bible and my tie. Oh, wait, no, that's Christmas. That goes down here uh, and Easter, uh, right? Or, or whatever it is. And okay, now I have my church stuff. But now Monday's coming. I got to get ready for work. So I kind of put my church stuff away in a drawer, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up Monday stuff for work or school or whatever I'm going to be doing this week. And, and these drawers don't touch. They're all separate 
compartments that aren't really connected together. And that's kind of somehow, somehow, sometimes how we treat our life. But that's not the way the Bible describes the new life in Christ. It's not a bunch of compartments that, that you kind of take things out and put things away. Things aren't all separated from each other. We don't leave church behind on Sunday morning. Sunday morning is the first day of the week. It is the start of our week of worship. And so maybe a better image of what the Christian life is supposed to look like, if in anything and everything is in the name of the Lord Jesus, then there's not a drawer for Jesus Christ in my, my, my uh, bureau or my chest of drawers of my life. Jesus is the piece of furniture. The new life in Christ is the piece of furniture in which all the other things, my family, my work, my fun, whatever else might be, fits into. So that there is no part of our life that is kept out of that life change. There's no part of our life that's kind of kept off to the side that God doesn't touch. That every little thing is used to glorify him. That's what the worshipful life looks like to devote all those things to him. Let's give some examples of, well, how do I actually do that? Well, let's take your work. You may uh, have a job that you love or a job that you hate, but either way, all of you at some day are going to have a bad day at work, right? Oh, the boss is giving me a hard time. I don't want to do this. And you have a choice to make. You could still do a good job uh, or you could do a bad job. But the thing is, when we are called to work as Christians, if we are called to worship him in every area of our life, we reorient our minds and think about the things that are above and say, oh, no, no, I'm not working this job just because... I have to make money. I'm not just working this job and doing a good job because my boss asked me to because he's driving me crazy this week. I'm doing it for God. God provided me this job as a way to provide for myself and or my family. God has given me this opportunity to work. So I'm not going to work as if for men. I'm going to work for God. The work that I do, I'm going to pretend I am, or not pretend. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm going to, I'm going to truly act like this work is for the Lord. I'm turning in my school assignment to God, not to my teacher. Ooh, that makes it a little more serious, right? But that's what it looks like to take all these things of our life and apply them to God. Maybe the work or school one is kind of obvious, so let's, let's pick another one uh, that we can do. Let's say, well, here's a good example. Um, I, when I sit down to dinner, and really all my meals, but let's just use dinner as the example because my family is there. Uh, it's something that we kind of set apart. Like we do our family dinners, no meetings, nothing gets away except for Good Friday. That's the only one. We do dinner every other <laughs> night of the year. And we pray before our meal. And it's interesting that when Paul is explaining this, this new life and this worshipful life there to live, thankfulness comes up a bunch Right as we approach the end. And in fact, as we approach verse 17, it comes up three more times. And so we take a moment in our day to pause and thank God for our food. And glorify him in this meal that we are about to share. I'll tell you, when I became a new believer in Jesus Christ, that dinner prayer was my favorite thing. It was my favorite thing about being Christian. I know it sounds strange, but it was. I was super excited because you know what? No matter how good my day was or how bad my day was, no, how, no, no matter if I felt like I was on a spiritual mountaintop or in the valley of the shadow of death that day, I would come and I would sit at that table and I would be thankful for this food that God had helped provide for me because he is the provider of all good things. And glorified him in that meal. I mean, that's the paradigm for a lot of things. I shared last spring, let's talk about something more mundane that we could use to glorify God. We went to a baseball game, went to the Fighting Phillies up in Reading, uh, and I actually shared the, to you that weekend what happened. Uh, so they do a couple things during the game to kind of make it family friendly. They have the hot dog launcher guy. Have you been to a game? And they launch hot dogs in the stand. Well, guess what? They launched a hot dog right at us. Bam, and I caught it. Isn't that amazing? And not only that, but they start launching soft baseballs in the crowd later in the game. Funk, 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 funk. And guess one? Guess what? Ethan got that one. We got two things at the game. Isn't that amazing? And I could have gone home and been like, that was a great day and that was awesome. But you know what? Those good things happened to me made me pause and be so thankful. Not just for the game and the fun and all that thing. But to pause for a moment and be like, I am so thankful for my family. I'm so thankful for what God has given to us. Sometimes we have good days, sometimes we have bad days. But in that moment, I was just thankful for us being together and having this good time together. 
And God was glorified in that game. And so what you'll find is if you start practicing this, even when you go out to ice cream, or I guess this season, well, it's always ice cream season for me, but hot chocolate, or whatever, you, whatever you're doing, when you start thinking in that respect, to be thankful, when you th- start putting on that new life in Christ and treat everything like it could be something that could be glorified to God, it's going to change things for you. It's going to change your kind of perspective. It's going to make you think differently about all the things that you are doing. And you'll find out, maybe I, maybe I thought it was silly to glorify God through this little nothing that I do. You're going to find it might be much more meaningful in your life when you do. So that's the big idea of what Paul is saying here. But it's interesting, we haven't talked about any of the list of new attributes, the new self in Christ that we are to put on. And the list that he gives us is very interesting for a couple reasons. One, and we're going to read through them in just a second here, this list that he gives us are all relational things. They're all interpersonal ways of living our life together. Did you notice that? Uh, When we talked about taking off the old self, there were some that were just kind of personal, purity, holiness type things uh, uh, and ways to live. But but when it came to to this list, it was all things that were highly... Uh, relational, which I thought was very interesting. And not only that, there's a second thing I noticed reading through this list this week, that all of them are attributes that Jesus Christ took on himself when he came and lived and died for us. Actually, if you look down the list, all of them, which makes sense when we think back to the beginning of this section, when he says, set our minds on the things that are above or seek the, things that, uh, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. If we are fixing ourselves on God and who he is, then no wonder the putting on the new self looks like God himself. No wonder it looks the way Jesus looked because he is the perfect image of God. So let's, let's, let's walk through this list a little bit in, in chapter 3. It says, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. He says first, compassionate hearts. Compassionate hearts. I, I like that he said it this way. He didn't say just act compassionately or look like you're compassionate on the outside. He said, no, 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 no. Have compassionate hearts hearts. It's the internal condition of yourself. He's one you just acting like you're compassionate. That's not putting on the new self in Christ. The new self in Christ is actually having your heart be compassionate for other people. And we saw Jesus act this way, didn't we? We saw God himself put on this, uh, this attribute of compassion when he sent Christ for us. Not when we were perfect, not when we had our, all our lives together, but when humanity was a mess, he had compassion on it and desired to save us. Compassionate hearts. He says to put on kindness. Has God been kind to us? Yes. Listen, when, when humanity rebelled right in the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, and, and they're about to get kicked out of the garden. Listen, God could have just wiped out the human plan right then. He could have been like, you know what? Human thing didn't work out. I'm done with it. But that's not what he did. Because of his kindness, he allowed us to live. Because of his kindness and his generosity towards us, he gives us a life that some might come to faith and live eternally with him. We're to put on kindness because God has put on kindness. We're to put on humility. Ah, humility is an interesting one. Because I think think sometimes we misunderstand humility. Sometimes I think, uh, sometimes we look at humility and be like, well, I don't want to think too much of myself, which is good. And so I'm just going to beat myself up. Well, I'm no good. Well, I don't know anything. Well, I'm not, I'm not any good at this or that. Well, that's not really humility either. What humility is, is thinking less about yourself and more about others. It's not being self-obsessed about yourself being good or bad. It's not being egotistical or beating yourself up all the time. That's not, you know, humility or pride. It is how much are you thinking about those around you? That's the kind of humility that is in view here. And that especially makes sense when we think of Jesus and the humility put on. Did he have any need for humility? No, he's the creator of the universe. By him and for him and through him, all things were made that were made. And yet, he humbled himself, God himself, to come live among humanity. And humbled himself to die on the cross for our sins. Humility, another aspect we are to put on if we are 
living our whole lives in Christ. Patience. Boy, that one's really hard. We're going to skip that one. No, I'm just kidding. Patience. We're to put on patience. Patience with one another. Patience waiting for God to act. Uh, and I think especially in this contact, patience with one another. Because all of us are imperfect and sometimes we need a little patience with each other. Amen? Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, and cer certainly patience is something that God has displayed for us as well. How patient God is with us. How many times we kind of stumble and fall. How many times we don't quite get it right. And he is patient over and over and over again. He's patient. And then in 13, it says, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. And we see bearing with one another. And this is not like we've read in other passages of the Bible. This is not bearing with one another. This is bearing with one another, all right? This is, I heard one pastor describe it as, this is how you act when someone steps on your toes. And because we are all just imperfect people seeking a perfect God, are we going to step on our toes sometimes? Maybe. Yeah, we are. We're going to do that. And so what do we, it's not that we, we, we're going to always be able to prevent stepping on each other's toes. It's going to happen sometimes. The real question is, what do we do with that? And so he says, bear with one another, forgiving one another when something goes wrong between you. And why do we forgive one another? Even if we didn't maybe earn it or deserve it? Because Christ has forgiven us through what he did on the cross when we trust in him. I like the way it's phrased here in the English translation. I think it's accurate, but it's very firm. So you also must forgive, it says. Forgiveness can be hard sometimes, and sometimes it's a process, and that's okay if it's a process. But we are called to be a people who are forgiving the way God forgave us. And how much did God forgive us? Everything. Verse 14, he says, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Like, if you look at all the ones we've mentioned so far, they all are oriented around love. We're more patient when we're loving to one another. We're going to forgive one another as an act of loving one another. Humility and putting others first is a love for one another. Kindness can be an expression of love for one another. It kind of sums it up there with love. And he says in, in verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and in, it's a new sentence, and be thankful. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What kind of peace is he talking about here? Well, it's the peace that God gives us that doesn't make sense uh, necessarily, but it is, is it is a peace. And in this case, it's a little more specific. It's not just a general peace about whatever our situation is. It's peace with one another. And we know that because of the context. The context being... He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And if it was just a period there, we'd be like, okay, this is just that general peace. We're like, everything's chaotic about me, and yet God has given me a peace to help endure this situation. No, no, in this case, it, it, it's followed by, to which indeed you were called in one body. That we are to be peace with one another. True peace, right? Like when we put on compassionate hearts. Not just acting peacefully. This is, a, this is a bold one because we live in a very vengeful culture right now because the way kind of online communication works, it, all it is is people sniping at each other and beating up on each other. Even when you watch the news, they're making fun of each other, like the other news station channel or YouTube YouTuber or whoever it is, right? That's the kind of culture we live in. And so we are instead called as a people of God to live in peace with one another and a true peace that, that is in our hearts. That's a little bit harder. I don't know if Lancaster County, if we here are so vengeful, I think what we tend to do is, well, this thing happened between me and this other person, so I'm just going to never talk about it again. And I'm just going to let it boil down in there, and we're not going to talk about it, because we're at peace! Arrgh! Right? That's not the kind of peace he's talking about. He's talking about a peace that has reached down into our hearts, because we are called to live as one body, all parts of something greater that God is doing as he brings together his people, the church. And then he also says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Then when we are in God's word, it will affect the rest of our actions. Not only will it encourage us to put on the new self, but we have the opportunity with one another. The source of this, again, is letting the word of God dwell in you richly, which includes the scriptures. That's why we made a big deal about our Bible reading plan. I didn't even mean to put this in here. It just happens to be in my Bible today. And if you, if you fell off our Bible reading plan somewhere along the line, or you've come to Pine Grove since then, jump in. I know it's November and there's only two months left. That's okay. It's about knowing God and understanding who he is and who he has called us to be. You could still pick up one of these in the back. I would encourage you to jump back in or start with us, even if it's at the very end of our program. I think that's a really beautiful picture that, that this, this dwelling, letting the word of God dwell in our hearts kind of spills out into the community around us. It's one of the beautiful things about when we gather together here to sing the songs that we sing, that we end up encouraging and teaching one another the central truths of the Christian faith. That's why singing is a big deal. I'm very grateful that Pine Grove is a church that sings. Pine Grove, is, I've been to a lot of churches around the country, is one of the only churches that has a traditional service like I have where, where the people actually sing that I've witnessed. And that's great because you are encouraging each other with these songs. Now, the point of our worship service is to glorify God. The point of our worship service is to orient ourselves towards him. The point of our worship service is to seek the things that are above and give glory to God in all the things that we do. But one of the side benefits of us gathering like this together is we end up really encouraging each other as we sing. I'll never forget this. There was someone who uh, was actually here at Pine Grove several years back. And they were just going through a tough season, a rough time. And they, they told me after church that day, they're like, I came in the service. I barely made it to church. And I sat down and I just couldn't even sing. Like, that's how heavy my heart was. That's what a burden I was carrying with me that week. I couldn't even sing to God. I was so distraught. This person then said to me, but then I listened to the people singing around me. And by the end of that service, my life wasn't fixed and all the things that were going wrong weren't all the way better. But I was more connected to God. And I couldn't sing that week, but they sang for me and carried me along. That was really powerful. You're not, you're not just glorifying God for singing for yourself. You're glorifying God in the way you kind of carry, we carry one another along as we sing these songs uh, together. It's a beautiful thing. And then he ends, of course, with verse 17. Anything and everything to be done for the glory of God. And so all these things, I mean, we could probably do a sermon on any of them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop for now because, uh, because these are all, you know, <laughs> big, big things for us to do in our life. But Paul lists them like this and doesn't go into detail himself because he wants us to see the whole. That it is really important that we are together. That such a huge part of the new life of Christ is not what we do when we're alone, but what we do with one another. That so big of a part of living the, the life of Christ is how we treat one another that we are called to be together, that we cannot do this Christian life alone, that we must gather as the church and be together and, and do life together and know what's going on with one another's lives, to be praying for one another, forgiving one another when we step on each other's toes, to be helping build one another up as the word of the Lord dwells in our minds and in our hearts. And it's with that that I want to talk about a couple applications. Like, okay, how do we live this? Well, there's two, two things I really want to go over as we kind of finish up here. One is, look at your life. There may be some anything or everything in your life that really isn't devoted to God, that kind of is in its own drawer somewhere in your life rather than being connected to the whole. If that thing is there, boy, maybe this is the week to be like, you know, I'm going to be thankful to God or I'm going to do this for God or in some way turn it into something that is glorifying to God. Recognize his lordship over all things. Recognize what Christ has done for you, whether it's you know, at work, at school, some little thing you're doing, some mundaneness of life, and say, this is going to be for the Lord now. And see how things change. Because I think it's going to change things for you. And the second thing I want to encourage you is something that Pine Grove has a deep history with, is its, is its relational nature. To continue to get to know one another. 
to continue to be there for one another, to continue practicing the things that it talks about here, that is the new life of Christ, which must be done together. And, I, and I've, I've talked to some people, especially if you've been here 30 or 40 years, you say, boy, there's a lot of new people. I don't know all these new people who are here. We have a lot of great opportunities to get to know them. Invite them over inv or invite them to lunch. Or, you know, we're having a, a luncheon today over in the great room. Here, here's what you could do. Go sit with someone that you don't know real well. Go sit with someone. I mean, you could sit with your friends at the luncheon after church, or you can go sit with someone that you really don't know that well at all and get to know them and learn what makes them tick and hear their story and continue to build what God has called us to build here at Pine Grove Church. If you have no connection here at Pine Grove Church, you might consider a community group. We mention community groups a lot, not that everyone has to be in a community group, because if you have some kind of deep biblical community where you're able to practice these things and kind of be involved with them, well, that's great. But if you don't have a place, here's the place for it. And we believe that spiritual growth happens as we come together as his people. And so if you haven't plugged in anywhere, if you haven't really have those connections with other believers in your life who know you, know what's going on, are praying for you, you are praying for them, I would encourage you to still come to Pastor Jaden, who helps run our community groups, uh, seek him out, and, and, and join one to have an opportunity to practice some of the things that the scriptures are talking about here, which will grow your faith and bring glory to God. You can always jump into, and the great thing about the way we've kind of set this up here is Jaden will, will help find you a group. You tell him about your availability, what you're looking for, and he'll help connect you for a group. We don't just kind of leave you on your own to go find one. Uh, it's really nice the way he does that, and it really helps our group dynamics and the way people treat one another in these groups. So I want to encourage you to do that. But I want to encourage you to not forget that, to not think that Christian, uh, the Christian life is something that we do on our own that it is done together, that we glorify God in the way we treat one another. And if we're going to do that, then there's something that we are going to have to approach together and do together in a radical way that is different than the way we are necessarily trained in the societies and the cultures in which we grew up. That God has called us in each and every area, in anything and everything, to glorify him, especially when it comes to the way we treat one another. Because when we do seek the things that are above, we do start to treat one another the way Christ has treated up. And it really changes everything in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful. As your word says, to be thankful as we dwell on who you are and what you've done for us. And Lord, I pray you would help us understand the areas of our life that maybe we've kind of kept separate uh, and then show us what it looks like to live that for you, to glorify you in each and everything that we do and how that will change our perspective on the way we live every day. I pray, Lord, that we would be the kind of people who are described here putting on the new self. That, Lord, if there has been some stepping on toes, that people would go to one another. That they would forgive one another that they would find that peace that we have because the most important thing in our lives is you and that unites us together. I pray you would help us put on all these aspects, that we would treat one another the way Christ has treated us. Grace and mercy and kindness, humility, compassion, patience, and most of all, love. Because you are a God of love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.